we going? Okay, y'all turn to John chapter 1. <clears throat> While y'all turn in there, I'll remind anybody that wants CDs or DVDs, just let us know. We'll send you whatever you need. Or if you need basic ones to give somebody, let us know. We'll take care of that. And um, anybody that's coming to the conference in October, it's, it's getting close. It's like six weeks away. So if you hadn't let me know about your room yet, let me know where I can get that ready. Or if you're coming and you're staying somewhere else, let me know that too. So we're trying to get a head count for food. Anything else, Lexi? Oh, send y'all's pictures in if you want your pictures on the thing Lexi's putting on there. Lexi, you got to retake ones too of Chris and Dina. and we got Dina and her crown, but I come out all fuzzy. I don't know what. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, what we're going to do tonight, Frank in Chicago, I hope you're watching because two other people asked me about this and then he asked me yesterday, so we're going to go ahead and cover it and I had it on my list. All right. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, the next day John, John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, what do y'all suppose that means? Well, y'all reckon it means what it says? Okay, okay. Now, he says, verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I come baptizing with water. So then why was John baptizing with water? So, he, so the Lord would be manifest. So then was this baptism required for the Lord to be manifest? So not only is it going to prepare a group of people for him to be manifest too, but watch how he's going to be manifest. 32. John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Then when he was baptized, did the baptism identify him? At his baptism, down comes the Spirit. Verse 33. I knew him not, but that he, he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So when did John realize Jesus was the Christ? When he baptized him. So did his baptism then manifest Christ? Yes. Okay. So we're just going to go, we're going to work from left to right. All right, here we got John's baptism. Okay. First thing it did, it was to manifest. What does manifest mean? Make known. Manifest Christ. Is manifest another way to say identify? So then John's baptism was to identify Jesus as the Christ. When he baptized him, the Spirit came down, and he's identified as the one, isn't he? Okay. Now John goes on with this baptism. Uh, tell you what, flip over to, uh, uh, go to Matthew. Well, no, go, go, let's go backwards. Go to Luke. Um, <clears throat> Luke 3. All right, Luke 3, 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, that's about 26 A.D. according to history, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and of the uh, region of Trichonitis, and Licinius, the uh, tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Now there weren't two high priests, but one had been high priest. And Y'all remember when Vladimir Putin was president over there for a while, and then he couldn't be president again? And he had another guy there that was president, but who was really running the show? But that's, that's kind of it. He's got his son-in-law in here, and he's continuing to pull the strings. Um, anyway, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So did God speak to John. Yeah, and we know what he told him. He told him, when you baptize, and the one you see the Spirit descending on, that's the Messiah. So he says in verse 3, He came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now please notice how that's worded. The preaching is the baptism of repentance. So then John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Then what did it symbolize? 
What's repentance mean? It's, it's symbolizing some people that are having a change of thinking, a change of heart about something, right? What are these people visibly showing they're having a change of mind about? Yeah, breaking the covenant. The law they're under. They're admitting failure under the law. Now he says it's a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then was the baptism required to get the sin in remission? Did the baptism come before the remission or after? Before. It's a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Make sense? Then was this water baptism absolutely necessary? Okay, it's necessary. Tell you what, I'm going to put it up here in blue. It's water. Right? Now, is that a baptism? Okay, we're going to put number one right here. That's a baptism. All right, flip on over to uh, Mark. Mark chapter 1. All right, Mark 1, verse 3, it's quoting the Old Testament. Verse 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then there ain't no doubt about that, is there? Okay, does everybody agree that that's what he was doing then? Okay, flip over to Acts chapter 2. All we're going to do, we're just going to keep comparing these back and forth and let's just let the scripture show us what it wants to show us. All right, now in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to come right over here, and I'm going to put Peter. And when I say Peter, by implication, I'll put the 12, right? After the cross right here. <clears throat> he says, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now what were they pricked in their heart about? They had killed the Messiah. Verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Then is there, is it still over here a baptism for the remission of sins? Then it's still a baptism of repentance, isn't it? And it's still for the remission of sins. Was it required in Acts chapter 2? Okay. I'll put up here Acts. Okay, <clears throat> now he goes on to say, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what preceded the Holy Ghost? Baptism. baptism. Could you get the Holy Ghost without the baptism? No, it's, there's an order to it. Huh? At that time, Tony's got it. Hey, Tony, you got it? Take it. <laughs> Tony's got it, doesn't he? Is this going to change? Yeah, it's going to change. And all we got to do, let's just read what it says and let it change when it changes, okay? All right, let's flip over to Matthew 3. In Matthew 3, verse 1. All right, in Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying... Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is there an order to these things? Yes. Then the first thing, before a person would ever submit to this baptism, admitting uncleanness, what would he first need to have? Repent, I need to change his mind. He would need to see, hey, I'm not okay under the law, right? Mm -hmm. So then I've got some sin here and I've got a problem and I'm admitting I've got a problem. Now the first step to the solution is I've got to be water baptized, right? then he could get the remission of sins and after the cross of the Holy Ghost and on and on. But so baptism comes first. Now verse uh, 5 says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Then there's a confession that goes along with this, isn't there? All right? The confession is actually, that's part of the repentance, isn't it? What had they confessed prior to confessing this what would their confession been prior to this? Yeah, we're innocent. We're God's chosen people. We're right. We're, we're the ones, right? So then the changing of mind involves a confession, doesn't it? Okay? Now he says they go out and they get baptized. Verse 7, 
when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Then did this baptism deliver these people from the wrath to come? All right, I'm going to come over here and I'm just going to write wrath to come. Now, we don't need to limit wrath to a future event. The wrath fell on them and it came on and I'll show that. But I just want to show you that there's wrath to come, right? Now, let me prove to you that wrath was not just a future event. Okay? Did most of Israel obey or did most of Israel disobey this order? They disobeyed. Okay? Hold Matthew 3 and flip over to Ephesians um, chapter 5, I think it is. Yeah. Chapter 5, Ephesians 5, verse 6. Paul says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Now what tense is cometh? Present tense. Then when Paul wrote this, was the wrath of God, was it coming on some people? Well, who did it begin to come on over here? Israel. For what reason? Disobedience. Unbelief. Disobedience is unbelief. So then the wrath was coming on them. Then is it just a future event or has wrath been coming on them for 2,000 years? It has, folks. There's, there's worse to come yet, right? Just to, Let's double check ourselves. Flip over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, uh, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Okay, so it is falling on them, isn't it? Okay, back over to Matthew. He tells, John tells these folks that the ones that get baptized will avoid the wrath to come. Make sense? Okay. Now watch what he goes on to say. Uh, uh, <clears throat> verse 9. Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. In other words, being part of the old nation ain't going to get it done, is it? He says, Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. What was the fruit John was saying would be proof of their confessing and repentance? The, the admitting and baptized, right? In other words, the Pharisees come out there watching what he was doing, and he said, if, if you really believe what's going on, you'd be getting baptized. Were the Pharisees about to get in the water with the drunks and the bums? No, okay? Now he says, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Then there ain't no doubt about it. John's water baptism preceded the, the, what they were looking for, right? Baptized unto repentance for the remission of sins. That's a baptism. Everybody agree? He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. All right, let's deal with this. <clears throat> when did Jesus Christ baptize these people with the Holy Ghost? Acts 2, right here. He pours out the Holy Ghost on them, doesn't he? Okay, is that a baptism? All right, Holy Ghost. Is the Holy Ghost water? Is water the Holy Ghost? So that's baptism. It also says, though, he's going to baptize them with fire. Let's draw it over here. Fire. Okay. Is fire water? Is fire the Holy Ghost? Then is this a third baptism? Okay. 
Remember baptisms identified, right? Did the water baptism identify those that were admitting they had failed under the law and were looking for a different way? It identified them, didn't it? Did the Holy Ghost identify those after the cross that believed and were approved to preach the message? How did it identify them to the people? Power, signs, and wonders. Then the Holy Ghost, that baptism was for identification, wasn't it? You say, well, it was to perform the signs. The signs identified them. It confirmed their words, didn't it? But there's a baptism by fire over here. And what are we saying baptism means? Identified. Identified by water as believing John's message. Identified by the Holy Ghost as being approved of God to preach a message. Identified by fire? What in the world? Huh? It's a judgment. It's a judgment for sure. Watch what he says in the next verse. Um, all right, he says, baptized with fire, verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, the Lord, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then is there going to be a separation when he comes by fire? Okay, does everybody agree with that? Is the baptism about identification? Well, who's going to burn up in the fire over here? The chaff gets burnt, right? How do you spell chaff? Okay. No E. Oh, all right. All right, so the chaff gets identified because what happens to them? They burn up. But there's a better identification than that. He's going to baptize another group by fire. The fire is going to do what fire normally does to chaff. It's going to burn it up. It, hey, huh? Are we part of a baptism too? Yeah, we're going to get there. We sure are. Okay, now flip over from here with this baptism by fire. Go to uh, Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians verse chapter one verse five. Paul's talking about the persecutions these people are going through, tribulations. He says, which is a manifest token, then was it a sign? Then it's not a supernatural sign, it's just a sign. What they were going through proved that they were believers, right? You know what proved a Jew? You, if you go into a synagogue and Paul comes in and he preaches Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're a Jew and you believe that message, what did you just bring on yourself? Huh? Persecution from the unbelieving Jews, right? If you really believed, you'd really endure that persecution, wouldn't they? What if they said, you know, this sounds good, but I don't believe I'm going to put myself through that. I'll just sit back here. There, there's an identif identifying factor here, right? Now watch closely. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing to God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask you from that verse, when the Lord comes back, are there going to be men that have been preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Then is it just going to be the gospel of the kingdom like a lot of times people you know, say? Or is it going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ? Okay. Is he going to come in flaming fire? What's the fire going to do? It's going to cleanse. What's it going to cleanse? The chaff from the wheat, right? I'll put the wheat over here. <clears throat> Let's just do it this way. Here's wheat. And I'm going to put the wheat into the fire, and I'm going to put the wheat out of the fire. All right. <clears throat> Y'all flip over to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. <clears throat> All 
All right, Daniel 3, 1. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar the king. That's the king of Babylon, right? We'll put him back over here. We've got Nebuchadnezzar back here. I'm just going to write Nebi because I can't spell it. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar back here is going to set up an image, right? Watch what the image looks like. He made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. What's three score? Sixty, right? Whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. It's sixty cubits high, it's six cubits wide, right? He says um, he set it in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, who else set up a tower in Babylon? Nimrod, didn't he? Where does this same thing keep happening in the Bible? In the land of Babylon. What is the Antichrist called over here? The uh, He's Assyrian. Where, where's Assyria? It's the same place. Okay, now he says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king got to gather the princes. He gets all these people together and tells them they've got to worship it, right? Uh, verse 4, Then a herald cried aloud to you, It is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer. All kinds of music they're going to hear. How many instruments? Okay. Now he says, When you hear this, uh, you're going to have to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has made. Whosoever falleth not down and worship the same, Shall, shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. All right. What is the period of time coming over here called in the Bible? Jacob's trouble. How about great tribulation, right? We'll write that. Do you all know what the tribulation is referred to? It's referred to as a furnace. What's that mean? Hot, bad, right? What was Egypt called back here when they were in Egypt? They were in the furnace. They weren't literally in a furnace, were they? But they were in a furnace. Well, guess what this time over here is called? A furnace. Are there going to be some people of God that are going to go right into the great tribulation? Is the fire going to burn them? Are they going to pass right through it and go into the land? Then are they going to be identified as God's people by a baptism with fire? So then this fire baptism is going to show the proofs in the pudding, right? Uh, all right, Game of Thrones. Y'all started Game of Thrones yet? Yeah. yeah, okay. Game of Thrones, they had a prophecy about the coming Queen of Dragons, right? What was going to identify, what was going to be the identifying marker of this queen? She couldn't be burned. She, that girl, good look, huh? Yeah, you got it. She picked, yeah, okay. Chris already knows she can't be burned. She picked up an egg and it didn't burn her, right? But then she takes that egg and she goes one night and sits down in the middle of a fire like she's committing suicide and everybody cries. And the next morning she comes out, not a stitch of clothes on, one of the best scenes in the whole show. She come walking out butt naked, her clothes completely burned off of her. Was her hair singed? What did that, what did that ordeal, what did that experience prove? She was the mother of dragons, right? What is this experience over here going to prove about these folks? They're God's people, aren't they? Are they God's people destined to go up, or are they God's people destined to go into something? Into something, okay? Flip over to, uh, by the way, over here, y'all know the story. Daniel's got three friends, and they will not worship the image, right? Daniel's three friends back here. You got it, all right? Look, I'm going to draw the furnace like a Bebo's car wash. Those three characters go into that furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in there and he said, wait a minute, how many we throw in there? They said, three. He said, well, I see four. He said, there's one in there like the Son of God. Who was in there with them? Did they pass right through it? When they come out the other side, y'all know what the people, what Nebuchadnezzar said about them? He said, Y'all got the real guy. Y'all are guy. Hey, y'all. Did that identify them? Yeah. It identified them as being under the providential care of God Almighty, didn't it? Mm -hmm. What's it going to do over here? Same thing. Now flip over to Matthew 24.
All right. Every time you read the word saved in Scripture, it doesn't mean saved from hell. Okay? There's all kinds of things you can be saved, delivered from, right? Paul told Timothy if he would teach the people the uh, good doctrine, they'd be saved from all that false doctrine. Not saved from hell, saved, delivered. Well, over here talking about this coming time over here, Matthew 24, uh, verse 12, he says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure, survive, endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, who's going to endure unto the end of it over there? Yeah, not us. <laughs> All right, so they go, he's saying they're, they're going to be saved, and he tells them, verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Look, he takes them in their mind right back here. Daniel talked about a coming abomination over here that the world's going to have to worship, right? Who is the world going to be required to worship over here? The Antichrist, the Assyrian. Okay? He's going to make an image, and they're going to have to worship him. Now, back here... A Babylonian king made an image and those that didn't worship him were thrown into the fire and yet God protected them, right? What's going to happen to those over here that won't take the mark of the beast? Same thing. Now he goes on here talking about it. He says, um, verse 16, Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out, neither take his clothes with him. Hey, this is going to be a bad time, isn't it? But are they going to flee out into the wilderness? Is the Lord going to protect them? He is. He says, Pray that your flight be not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. His flesh, for me and you looking to have our flesh saved to get into the kingdom of God? Then are we talking about people over here that need their flesh saved to go up or flesh saved to go in? Go in, okay? It, yeah. Let not your flight be in the way. He, basically, what it really boils down to, he's telling them this is Jewish folks, right? Are they going to have to take off running out of there? He's saying, I hope it ain't on a Sabbath day because would a Jew travel so far on a Sabbath day? Yeah, in other words, he, you better, <laughs> they're going to still be so legal-minded, don't let the law prevent you from getting out of there. Yeah, if that, if that helps. All right, now he says, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. So then are there going to be some people's flesh that's saved over here? Then the enduring until the end, is it talking about enduring so that a spirit could be saved and go up, or is it talking about these people that survived this go into the kingdom? They go into the kingdom, don't they? Flip over to Revelation 12. All right, we've got a woman here. <clears throat> and notice her signs in heaven. It's not in the earth. And verse 5 says, She brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So I've got this woman over here, right? And from the midst of this woman, a man child comes, right? And is caught up. But what happens to the woman? She goes on, okay? But she's, got, she's going to go out where she's protected. Come on down to verse uh, 13. When the dragon saw that he, he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. To the woman were given two wings, like for flight, of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. There's the flight he just, we just saw in Matthew. Into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. How long's time, times, and half a time? All right, so I got a fire over here that's going to test the entire earth for three and a half years, right? Is that a baptism? Okay, it's called a baptism with fire, right? So do we have one, two, three baptisms up here? We do, okay? Now flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 13. Paul tells the Corinthians. <clears throat> he 
he says, for by one spirit. Now, is by the same word as with? No, it's not even close. Now, you know, it's the little words that make the biggest difference, isn't it? All right, if I, let's say, um, all right, let's say I hire Dina to paint this room, right? The room's painted by Dina. Then who did the work? Well, what if, what if Dina decides to paint the room with Chris? I did the work. <laughs> Wait a minute. George got it. Say it again, George. Chris would be on the walls. Think about it. She, I didn't say she, the room's going to be painted by Dina and Chris. I said Dina's going to paint the room with Chris. Not along with, with. She's going to slaughter Chris and paint the walls with him, right? Hey, the two words, they're not the same. They're not even close to the same. Now, this is a baptism with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was poured on these men, wasn't it? But now we've got, ooh, you okay, Bobby? <laughs> now, now, now we've got a baptism over here. I'm going to put it right here. By the Spirit into one body. Is that the same as water? Is it the same as with the Holy Ghost? Is it the same as fire? So is this a fourth type of baptism? Okay. Now there's some others, but let's just deal with these. All right. We've got water with the Holy Ghost by the Spirit and with fire. Right? Anybody got any questions about that? All right. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. All right, I'm going to do a timeline down here, kind of like this. I'm going to say right here is the book of Acts. Okay, We're just going to make Acts stand out like this. Right? Here's Acts. <clears throat> Paul writes Ephesians after Acts, over here. One of the last two books he writes, he writes Ephesians. Okay? He says, when he writes Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body... Now, were there two bodies or one? Then was there one body of believers called the body of Christ and another body of Jewish people called the kingdom church? Or was there one body? One body. One spirit. Does that mean one kind of spirit or one Holy Spirit? One Holy Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Was there two different hopes or was there one hope? One Lord, was there one kind of Lord or only one Lord? One faith, was there two different faiths being preached? Y'all see what's going out the window, don't you? The whole Peter's preaching the kingdom still, it ain't true. One baptism. Well, does that mean one type of baptism or only one baptism in number? One baptism. All right. If Paul said over here when he wrote Ephesians that there was one baptism... Which baptism did Paul say that we had to have? By the Spirit. If we've got to be water baptized, how many baptisms does that make? Two. If we've got to get the ghost, as the Pentecostals say, how many does that make? Two. Oh, yeah, they've got three, don't they? Actually, they don't have this when they got that. Well, that's my opinion. <clears throat> Think about the other end of this. If you and I have to go through the Great Tribulation, then there's a third baptism, isn't it? Do you and I have to be identified by fire? No, no we don't. Well, who do y'all reckon was caught up here before all this started? Yeah, you got it. All right, now watch closely. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. All right, so then there's a complete oneness here Paul's talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But when I go back over here, when Peter's preaching, did they have more than one baptism? Was Peter preaching and were they, was water baptism in Acts chapter 2, we'll just make two, did they have more than one baptism? Were people still getting the Holy Ghost? All right, how about Paul's group? Did they get the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts? They sure did. Then was there more than one baptism back here, right? There was a spiritual baptism and a baptism with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, yeah. Well, it depends. We, we're gonna go. We're gonna go to just hold tight to that. We're gonna go look at all of them. Okay. All right. So then, Paul also he told them they're baptized by the Spirit, but also they were baptized with the Holy Ghost in the Book of Acts, weren't they? But by the time Paul wrote Ephesians, was anybody else getting the Ghost like that? 
not according to the scripture. Why? This thing is the body of Christ is maturing. It doesn't need those training wheels, the signs and all that anymore, okay? So when he writes Ephesians, there's one baptism left, right? But let's go back and look from Acts chapter 2 how baptism hangs around, okay? Let's just go see what the scripture says. All right, flip over to Acts. All right, we just saw Acts chapter 2. Let's just jump on over. Uh, We'll go to Acts chapter uh, 8. In Acts chapter 8, Philip goes down into Samaria. He preaches Christ unto them. The people in Samaria believed like that, didn't they? Why were those people so primed to believe Philip's preaching? Everybody remember John 4? Who had been there years before? Jesus Christ. The woman at the well and the Samaritans, remember? Okay, so then he, he does. He's there and they preach. And verse uh, 12 says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed also when he was baptized. So then still got baptism going on over here, don't we? So in Acts chapter 2, we've got water, don't we? And do we also have Holy Ghost? Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let y'all in on a secret. They also had this one, but they didn't know nothing about it. Okay? Were they in Christ before Paul? How do you get in Christ? By the Spirit. So they had that one, didn't they? So they actually had three baptisms going back there, didn't they? And that continues along. Now go to Acts chapter 9. All right. Is Paul a Jew? Is Paul completely familiar with Jewish customs and rituals? Do y'all think that the day Paul got saved, he started eating pork chops? No. I doubt that seriously, right? He's a Jew. He's, I mean, this is his, his life's custom, right? Well, yeah, he's going to learn that. But he ain't thinking about charity this first three days. He's in a turmoil, isn't he? All right, so he, we got Paul sees the Lord, and let's just pick up Acts 9.9. He was uh, three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. We, we talked about this last night, and Ralph kept saying, boy, those three days. And Ralph just kept can you imagine those three days? I'm Ralph, no, can you all imagine Paul's state of mind for this three days? Hey, this guy's been killing people here, hasn't he? Now, verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. To him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. He said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. Now, is this man saved before Paul? Yes. Yeah, he's saved already, isn't he? Then what would he have undergone? Water baptism, wouldn't he? He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, and he might receive his sight. Did the Lord say anything about baptizing Saul? No. What did he tell Ananias to do? Lay your hands on him, and he receive his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, y'all know what he says. Hey, I heard all about him, but verse 15... The Lord said unto him, Go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So the Lord said, He's going to be my man to the Gentiles. Go do what I said, right? Verse 17, Ananias went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He immediately there fell from his eyes as had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. So does Paul get baptized? Now somebody said, well, this is his baptism in the, by the Spirit. Well, look, if you want to say that, that's fine, but it also appears that he had a water baptism. Now go over to Acts 22, and let's see if that's true. Paul's telling us what happened. We'll pick up in verse 12. Acts twenty two twelve. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me, stood, and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight, and the same hour I looked upon him. That means immediately. 
He said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now, that's what the Lord said. He's going to be unto the Gentiles, right? Now watch Ananias speaking. And now why tarriest thou? He's not quoting the Lord, is he? He's asking a question. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Then who suggested that Paul get baptized? Did the Lord tell Paul to get baptized? So in Acts 9, Paul does get baptized, doesn't he? Now, y'all know there are people in the world today that will say, if a believer gets baptized, they're lost. They can't be saved. They got baptized. Folks, did Paul get baptized? Y'all, I mean, use common sense. Don't Look, they've turned right division into a cult. I mean, dead serious. If you don't believe exactly what they believe, then you must be lost, right? Folks, why did Paul get baptized? He didn't know. It seemed like the right thing to do. If he believed, we know he believed. Look, you get a man in a, let's say a man goes into a, all right, they, today I suspect the gospel ain't being preached in many churches. I, I know that because I never heard it in the Baptist church I was in. Did you, Wayne? Okay. But 50 years ago, folks, they were preaching the gospel. We, we've gotten way past the point. I'll, I'll prove it to you. Last night I was sitting in Ralph's house. I said, Ralph, where'd you hear the gospel at? He said, in a Presbyterian church. Somebody would say, see there, Ralph's lost. Come on, folks, you ever met Ralph? <laughs> Did Ralph hear the gospel? What if a man heard the gospel in a Baptist church, heard the truth, Jesus Christ died, his sins are paid for, he trusts the Lord, he's brand new like a baby, and the guy says, okay, now you need to go to believer's baptism. What would he do? He'd do it. Does it change anything? No, he's, he, it's just a waste of time, but he's like a little kid. It's like you got a three-year-old and you say, hey, the moon's made of cheese and he believes you, doesn't he? Are you going to just beat the hell out of him because he believes that? No, he's a little kid. He did. That's worse. That's exactly right. He tried to go on keeping the law, didn't he? What I just want you all to see is Paul's just like anybody. He was a babe in Christ. He didn't know everything, did he? All right, so then Paul gets baptized into Christ, didn't he? There ain't no doubt about that, is there? Does Paul get baptized with water? Yep. And does Paul also get baptized with the Holy Ghost? Yep. All right. Now, was Paul's water baptism necessary? Yep. No. Now, let's prove it. All right, go back over to Acts uh, 10. Starting with Paul, these things are getting different, aren't they? All right, now Peter goes out, and Peter's sent to a uh, Gentile's house. He's sent there because how in the world are they ever going to accept Paul's ministry among the Gentiles unless Peter can confirm it? So the Lord's going to send Peter. He sends him out to this Gentile's house, Cornelius. In verse 28, Peter tells him, He said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Folks, was Peter still legal-minded in Acts chapter 10? But did God show him the Gentiles have been cleansed? Yep. So Peter's standing there. Then you know what I know Peter don't know yet? He don't know that the law was destroyed. Who's Peter going to learn that from? From Paul in Acts 12. Okay, now watch what happens. Peter goes in and starts preaching. Verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. All right, Peter thinks it's going to take a specific kind of Gentile here, right? It says, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. And pay close attention to that. When did Jesus begin preaching the kingdom of God? When they rejected John. He says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. What's Peter preaching to these folks? The gospel of God, right? 
And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews, Jerusalem, who they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which is ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, just a second. In order to get the remission of sins back here, what had to come first? Baptism and confession. Why did the confession have to come? Because they're all under the law contract, right? In chapter 10, has Cornelius ever a day in his life been under this contract? Then what's he need to confess? Folks, he knows he's a sinner. I mean, come on. He doesn't need to make this public confession or this Jewish ritual of washing. Now, it says again in verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Did they need to be water baptized? Then y'all see water baptism going away? And yet in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Ghost falls on them. Are they saved? Folks, you don't think God poured out the Holy Ghost on them in unbelief, do you? So then do they get baptized into Christ? All right. Do they get the baptism of the Holy Ghost? But watch what happens next. 45. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter also, that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. You know what Peter is going to say next? The only thing he knew to say. Watch. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and prayed they to tarry him certain. Who told him to get baptized? Was it necessary? Does Peter know that? No. Does Paul know it yet? No. All right, if we just keep tracking our way through here, we get over here to Acts chapter 16. And I find Paul, it appears, baptizing. Now, whether he did it himself or not, I don't know. But did, just, tell it, just flip over there, Acts 16. Acts 16, 14. Certain woman named Lydia, right? Verse chap, verse chap, chapter 16, verse 15. And when she was baptized in her household. Now, you could say, hey, that's spiritual baptism. Hey, I don't know. Either way, she's baptized, right? But look at this next character. Come over to uh, the Philippian jailer. Verse uh, 30. Brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to him that all that were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all of his straightway. Now I seriously suspect that's water, washing their stripes and then getting baptized. Anybody doubt that? So in Acts 16, Paul still is Got this water baptism going on, doesn't he? I'm just going to string along in blue, right? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> come on down to uh, chapter 18. Let's come on over here. All right, we still got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and we know they're being baptized in Christ. All right? All right, we come over to Acts 18, and Paul is in Corinth. <clears throat> Acts 18, verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I'll go unto the Gentiles. He departed thence and entered a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus... The chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So then were there some Corinthians baptized? Now, if they believed, were they baptized by the Spirit? Yes, but folks, they're also water baptized. Now, let's prove it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The man's name is Crispus, right? 
All right, go to 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1, verse 14. Now Paul writes this in Acts 19. Let's go put 19 over here, okay? In Acts 19, right here, Paul writes 1 Corinthians, okay? <clears throat> now, was he in Corinth in Acts 18? Yes. Did he baptize some folks? Yes. yes. He writes this in Acts 19, and watch what he says. Verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. What a statement to make if baptism was a good and necessary thing. Can you imagine you say, hey, how how you doing? How how'd classes go today? And I said, man, it went great. I had three or four classes. I preached the gospel and nobody believed me. What a great day. Wouldn't that be a stupid statement? Would Paul make such a statement if baptism was a good thing? You know why Paul makes it in this regard? Look at the next verse. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. In other words, what was baptism the ritual causing in Corinth? Factions and divisions. What does it cause today? One says you got to dip. One says no, you pour. One says face down. One says three times. One says babies. One says no, 12 years old. And they all split up over it, don't they? And you know what Paul said? Quit doing it. Then did Paul learn something from the time he left Corinth to the time he wrote 1 Corinthians? Yeah. He told them, uh, I, Christ didn't send me to baptize. Now, did Paul, in Acts 18, we still had water baptism, didn't we? Can you find Paul water baptizing anybody after that? Okay. So then later when he writes Ephesians after the book of Acts, he could say with all certainty we have one baptism, don't we? Because the baptism with water, he saw needed to stop. What did he say in 1 Corinthians? He said the spiritual gifts were about to come to an end, weren't they? Think about what he did in the 1 Corinthian letter. He basically put to rest all these customs, didn't he? So he says, water baptism? No, we baptize by the Spirit. He goes on and tells them all these things they're doing that are wrong. And when he writes Ephesians, he says there's one baptism and it's by the Spirit then me and you don't need water baptism. It don't do anything. Me and you don't get baptized with the Holy Ghost. We don't need it. We got the complete Word of God. And you and I don't need to go through the baptism by fire. Why would I need to go through this fire to be identified as God's when the moment I trusted Christ, the Bible says I was sealed? How does God know if you belong to Him or not? He got sealed. Then do I need to be identified through this process? No. Okay, now he goes on here. Uh, go back over to Acts 19 and let's look at one more passage. It kind of causes some confusion. <clears throat> yep, I tell you, go to Acts 18.24 first. Let's just deal with something real quick. Now, <clears throat> let's, just, let's just get out our thinking caps and let's just think for a second. In verse 24, A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So Apollos knows only about John's baptism of repentance for remission of sins, right? He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. When he was disposed to pass into a... Did he need to be rebaptized? No. He don't, there's no, he, there's no need for that, right? All right, so he goes on and he starts preaching the truth. He needed further edification, didn't he? Now go to chapter 19, verse 1. Here comes the problem. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Now I would suspect they probably were taught by Apollos. It's in the same place, but anyway, that's my opinion. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost? Then are they still receiving the Holy Ghost at this time? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, On what then were you baptized? In other words, they hadn't been baptized into Christ, have they? If they had been baptized into Christ, would they have received the Holy Ghost? At this time, yes. They said unto John's baptism. Then they'd been baptized with water, hadn't they? 
Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after them, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now please think what just happened to these men. People will tell you they had to be water baptized. Did Apollos have to be water baptized again? They already been water baptized. What baptism did they just receive? This one. They were baptized in the name of Christ or they were baptized in Christ. So a lot of times when you look at things, for instance, in the Great Commission, did he tell them to go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name? Don't always limit these things to water. Now, for a minute, just use your thinking cap here. Apollos had John's baptism, right? Priscilla and Aquila preached the truth to him, and he gets out there and starts preaching, doesn't he? These 12 men in Acts 19 had the same baptism. And when they hear Paul preach, Jesus is the Christ, the moment they believe, what happens to them? They get baptized. But you know what everybody says? They had to be re-baptized because John's baptism was no good anymore. Folks, that's crazy. If they had to be re-baptized, then guess who else would have to be re-baptized? The 12 apostles, Peter and all. Do you have any instance of someone needing such a thing? Now, the Baptist church will tell you, oh, yeah, their baptism wasn't uh, official. They had to have the right baptism. No. What baptism were they lacking? This one. The moment Paul preached unto them, Jesus Christ, and they believed, were they baptized? Then is there any water in that passage? No, there's no water there. Now, what happens is by the time we get over here to the end of the book of Acts, do the miracles stop? Do the, does the water baptism gone away? Then how many baptisms remains after the book of Acts? One. By one spirit. Now, there somebody would say, that's for us, but not for Peter and them. Well, you better check it out in Scripture. It's the same for Peter and them. Go over to uh, 1 Peter. One more verse. Watch what Peter says. Let's just believe what he says now. All right, were Peter and them also in Christ? What's the only way they could get in Christ? Baptized, baptized by the Spirit into Christ. All right. <clears throat> Did Peter know this back here in Acts 10? No. But does he get up with Paul in Acts 12 and does he begin to get some... Yeah, he starts to learn some things. Watch what he writes in 1 Peter uh, 3.18. Now, it appears to me he wrote this sometime between Acts 12 and 15. I, I don't know when, but sometime between there. But in Acts 3.18 he says... For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Is he preaching Christ died for sins? He says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Okay. When it says souls, what was actually saved in Noah's ark? Bodies. Souls are human beings. They're living souls. Eight of them were saved, weren't they? Were they saved by getting in the water? They were saved from the water. What were they saved by? They all got inside of something. And what did the ark? And what did God do? He sealed the door. What do y'all reckon the ark's a type of? It's the type of Christ, folks. Now watch Peter say it. <clears throat> Verse 21. The like figure of getting into that ark and getting saved, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Somebody said, see there, water baptism. No. Watch him say it. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What did Peter just say saved them? <laughs> baptism. He said, just like these folks were sealed up in the ark and saved from destruction, we got the same salvation because we're all baptized into Christ. Y'all see him say, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Water. It ain't nothing to do with water, does it? Did Peter now know that over here? Do you ever see Peter baptize anybody else? No. Y'all see how these things just go through Scripture? When you read Acts, you've got to understand something. Folks, when God changes something, God changes it. Boom, it changes, right? 
but do men automatically get that change? Took them a while, didn't it? I think about me and you, anybody in here. I baptized a couple people after I was saved. You know what? I'm glad I only baptized a couple. You know why? <laughs> it don't mean anything. You say, well, why did you do it? I thought it was the right thing to do. Well, you say, well, then you must have been lost. Look, I know when I trusted Christ, I was just stupid. I didn't know any better. I guarantee you right now, I'm preaching something that's completely wrong. I'm not doing it on purpose, and when the Lord shows me different, then I'll have to suck it up and change it. It ain't no big deal, is it? Okay. Ignorant, yeah, that's it. All right, I hope that helps with the baptism, Frank. Any questions? Yep. Yeah. They, there was a baptism back here, and they were all baptized unto or into Moses. Now think about it for a second. Did they get a drop of water on them? Is that a type of water baptism, or is it a type of everybody being baptized in the... It's spiritual, yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much.